God cannot lie He promised to save His people He never changed His mind Today He still calls them my people My people, my people Well hi there, welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. Alice and I want to greet you in the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we continue on in our study of the seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation, finding out, seeking mm -hmm. to find out those things that are pleasing to the Lord and those things that are displeasing, displeasing. to the Lord. Yes. Examining these cities as they were back then, Perhaps as they are today, mm -hmm. and as they will be, because we get these letters from the one who was, who is, and who is to come. Amen. Hallelujah. But it really, it makes a difference knowing the history on the background. It does, because Jesus was writing these yeah. things, and, and there's he deals with us where we are. Mm -hmm. Okay, So there are things in the history of these cities that is pertinent to the understanding of these letters, even in our time. All right. Um, here, by the way, we're back in Saddleworth, England. We've just returned from the Outer Hebrides in, yes. in northern Scotland. We had a blessed time ministering yeah. up there. It was wonderful. Yeah. It was absolutely blessed. Mm. So, But we're glad we can be back together again, even mm. though it's electronically, digitally. And I do want to remind you before we start that we would love to hear from you. You can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Uh, let us know where you're watching from. And, you know, just let's, we'd love to have a little chat with you. Sure. So, all right. We, we, last week, we finished up. We're, we're in that, the letter to the church at Pergamum. Pergamos, depending on which translation you're using. Okay. And we, we left off in our last session of the study in verse 13. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So we're going to pick it up there today as we continue on. But as we do, I'm going to ask Alice to read verse 13. But first, Father, I just want to ask your blessing upon our time. I just want to ask your blessing, Lord God, that we would be open to the working of your Spirit in our lives, the Spirit that you have sent to indwell us, to lead us into all truth. Lord, we desire to know the truth all the more. The truth being your Son, Jesus Christ. Our reason for this study, Lord God, ultimately, is to see your Son, Jesus Christ, more clearly. That we might see you more clearly. That we might be more like your Son. That's our desire, Lord, that, that you would use your word in our lives today. That we would be better, all the better equipped to serve you and bring glory to your name. So we just praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. All right, Alice, if yes. you would read verse 13 for us. Okay. I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas. My witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. All right. Uh, by the way, as I say, we covered most of that verse last week, or a lot. We, we spoke a lot last week, and if you've missed that, it's available on the website. So please go back and look at it. But where we left off, we were talking about Jesus saying that these saints in Pergamons had held fast to his name. With their very lives threatened, they would not. They refused to compromise. Mm. But rather, they did not deny my faith, he said. Amen. So that's where we're going to pick it up now. You see, there comes a time when we might have to join that great cloud of witnesses that is spoken of in, in Hebrews. That those witnesses who surround us, those witnesses of whom the Lord says the world was not worthy of them. Mm -hmm. We too have to be prepared, like those saints in Pergamum, to suffer to the point of shedding blood in order to not deny his faith. And in fact, and I'm sure you're okay. conscious of this as, as, at this time, there, there are many brothers and sisters in different parts of the world who are indeed suffering to the point of shedding their blood to hold fast to his name, Amen. to not deny his faith. We have to proclaim that our trust is in him and in him alone, for he is a jealous, jealous guy. Yes, yes. <clears throat> we all have different experiences 
And as I say, there are, there are brothers and sisters in many parts of the world today that are suffering even to the point of death. But what I do know from my experience in the years that Alice and I have walked with and served the Lord is that whatever He calls you to, whatever situation you find yourself in, He will give you the grace Amen. to Amen. deal with that situation. And it is amazing grace, it I is. want to tell you. Mm -hmm. So the, the things that the world, and remember we have nothing in common with the world, if you place your trust in those things, those things can't do any harm to you, but they can't do you any good, right? God spoke through Jeremiah a long time ago about world's man-made idols. Yes. And remember, that those idols include things like wealth, greed, which is called idolatry in the Bible. It, if you're trusting in the... Yeah, the anything that you put your trust in. In the things of the world. Mm -hmm. Because I just love this. I mean, in Jeremiah, God spoke to him and said, like a scarecrow in a cucumber field are they, and they cannot speak. It's talking about false gods, right? Yes. They must be carried because they cannot walk. Do not fear them, for they can do no harm, nor can they do any good. That's Jeremiah 10, verse 5. Mm -hmm. Think about that thing. Think about the fact that you can, you can say to me all day long that, you know, the little trinkets and baubles and statues or whatever you carry... And they can't, they can't harm you. They can't do you any good. You have the right, as a child of God, to go with confidence, you, to go mm -hmm. boldly before the throne of grace in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, who is our only intercessor, mm -hmm. as Paul wrote to Timothy. You can do that because He is the answer to any situation in your yes, life. He is. You see, that, that was not just a, a suggestion or an encouragement that Jesus said, as, as we've talked about before, do not fear those who killed the body, but are unable to kill the soul, mm -hmm. but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Matthew 10, 28. That's not a suggestion. It's not just an encouragement. It is a command of God. Yes. Fear not. All right? And here it talks about in the days of Antipas. Well, you know, about Antipas... We really don't know anything because that's, there's no other reference to him in Scripture. But the, So the reason for that is because it's not important for us to know other than what's revealed here. You see, while we don't know, I promise you, God does. He knows exactly. Yeah. And he wanted that name recorded in the Word for all eternity. That's right. That was the re, part of the reward for, for a faithful saint named Antipas, all right? He's known by God. And the Lord is showing that he was pleased with him. Absolutely pleased. Yeah. It's obvious from this verse that the believers in the city would have known of Antipas. Mm -hmm. all right? Otherwise, it couldn't have been stated like this. Right? Exactly. So they did know him. And it's reasonable to deduce that the faithfulness of Antipas would have become a powerful testimony to the rest of the church. Yes. Otherwise, it wouldn't be mentioned here. There's a story of his death that originates with Tertullian. <laughs> in the early part of the third century. But, you know, those accounts can often be a little questionable. Mm. But here's what God says, talking about Antipas, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you. Now, you see, here we encounter again that Greek word for witness, martis, or marteo. I mean, these are the words. And that's where we get our English word, martyr. Uh, this is what's called a transliteration, kind of. It's like, you know, they're taking the Greek word and making an English word out of it. But the simple fact of the word, fact, the simple fact of the matter, I can talk when I try. <laughs> the simple fact of the matter is that this word is just a witness. It's being a faithful witness. Mm -hmm. That's what we're to, to be. W will that involve being a martyr? Well, you know, it depends on your definition of a martyr, and it certainly can. It certainly can come to the point of death. Okay. It has nothing to do with a, a willingness to witness, okay. or I, I should say more correctly, it's about the inability to not witness, right. no matter what the consequence. See, that's we shouldn't be in a position where it's like we struggle to witness. It should be like you can't help it. You can't help it's but witness. It's part of our it, being. This always reminded me, you know, it brings me back to the, if you know the book of Job, the, uh, the, the young man, Elihu, right? 
Uh, Elihu comes to Job and his three sympathizing friends. May God protect us from those kind of sympathizing friends. And Elihu says this, For I am full of words. The spirit within me compels me. Indeed, my belly is like wine that has no vent. It's ready to burst like new wineskins. I will speak that I might find relief. I must open my lips and answer. Let me not, I pray, show partiality to anyone, nor let me flatter any man, for I do not know how to flatter, else my maker would soon take me away. That's Elihu in the book of Job, chapter 32, verses 18 to 22 is what I just read. It should be like that within us, that we're compelled to bear witness to Jesus Christ, that the spirit within us, it's like it should be bursting. Yes. To tell people about Jesus Christ, to tell people about God the Father, to tell people about the glory of God, to tell people about the faithfulness of God. Hallelujah. You shouldn't be, if, if you're able to hold that in, you got a problem. Yeah. You see, I, I often hear brothers and sisters, good brothers and sisters in the Lord, state that they don't know how to witness. I believe that the truth of the matter is that you have to learn how not to witness yeah, that's right. in order to reach that condition. And Satan's a willing teacher. You see, you have the ability. I, I, I think I, I mentioned this. I may have mentioned this last week. When I got saved, and this I know this may upset some people, I began to proclaim the gospel probably that same day. Mm. Hey, yeah, I know that same day. Mm. And you'd say, well, and, and, and I've shared my testimony if you've been to these Bible studies before, the fact that I had been raised a Catholic and didn't know the Bible at all. I had never read the Bible. So you can say, well, then how were you, how are you sharing the good news? proclaim the gospel? Mm. Because the instant I got saved, one thing I knew, I knew that Jesus Christ was Lord. Mm -hmm. I knew he was my Savior, and I knew that he loved me. Yeah. I also learned that day, just reading what scripture I, I read, that he's no respecter of men. Right. So he wanted to be your Savior, your Lord, your answer to all your solutions, and that He loves you. That's enough. If you know that God loves you and that you're not special, I mean, in, the, in that he, you know, he loves everybody that way, for God so loved the world, you have enough knowledge in you to go out and start sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Oh, yes, I pray that we all, that's why we do Bible studies, so we would grow in our knowledge, that we would be more and more equipped, better equipped, to share the Word of God and, and the message about Him. But that's all you have to know to begin to proclaim the Word, is that He loves you. Just sharing with people when somebody, when you know somebody loves you, it's, it's just an amazing I mean, that's, that's what everybody's looking for, somebody to love them. Yes, that's what they're looking for in the world, yeah. and they're looking in all the wrong places. And I promise you, I mean, you know, we, we have seen the impact as we've traveled the world just telling people about the simple truth about the love of Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. The love of God the Father, that's the word of the cross. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, and Paul wrote that, that, first of all, that we're not supposed to be ashamed of that gospel. And... That word of the cross is the power of God unto salvation. And that yeah. cross is the demonstration of God's love. Okay. Okay, what we do know about Antipas is that he was faithful unto death. Yes. That's what I just said, right? Mm -hmm. And the Lord has seen fit that his name should be a witness to the world yes. and an encouragement to Christians for all time. That's... Pretty neat, I want to tell you. I, I think that's a pretty good thing. That mm -hmm. God can use your name, all right? But I want to go on now. I want to read verse 14, all right? Okay. Revelation 2, 14, verse 14. Still talking to the church, at the, the letter to the church at Pergamum. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teachings of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. God says, I have a few things against you. Now remember, I said the, the purpose of this whole study is that we find the things that are displeasing to God. Mm -hmm. So if he says to the church of Pergamum, I have this against you, That's not, he's not pleased. This, is, this is what displeases him. Yeah. 
But let's be clear about something before we go on, right? He's speaking to the church, mm -hmm. the whole, that body, right? And he's saying, I have this against you, the whole body. See, the Lord spoke to the prophet Isaiah and he said, I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my mm -hmm. own sake. And I will not remember your sins, Isaiah mm -hmm. 43, 25. So once a sin is repented of, all right, well, what John says in 1 John chapter 1, he says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the fact that Jesus still holds this against them is that they have repented. Indicates absolutely that they have yet to repent of those sins. Mm -hmm. Because once you do repent of your sins, mm -hmm. it says, you know, here's what David said. For high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Yes. Psalm 103, verses 10 and 11. So you see, if we, if we repent, those sins are gone. They're forgiven, they're forgotten, and they are moved as far away as from you as they can possibly get, from the far as the east is from the west. And David also prayed that God would forgive the sins that he, he wasn't, wasn't even aware of. of. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is a, a good thing that we all need to do. Yeah, because um, that's a fact. Yes. I'll leave it at that. All right. Mm -hmm. So, since some of the church had chosen to hold to the sin, and the church as a whole has chosen to hold to the sinners... Jesus holds the sin against the church. Mm, right. Paul wrote, the Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, that we are not to associate. He said, when, when I wrote to you not to judge, he said, I didn't mean outsiders. Like, God will judge the outsiders. We, the church is so great at judging the outsiders. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's not what, here's, here's the deal. He said, we're not to associate with any so-called brother if he should be an immoral person or covetous or an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. 1 Corinthians 5.11. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the church that needs to be cleansed. Now they, in Pergamum, they, had, they were tolerating. Mm -hmm. There were people operating in sin within that church and they were being accepted. They weren't being dealt with. And you can't say, that they weren't that the church didn't know about it because God makes it clear here that He is yeah, right. Yeah. So so Paul in his time. I mean, I hear all this nonsense. There's a lot of nonsense about judgment. Okay. Yes, there is. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because we don't understand it. Paul wasn't afraid to name names mm -hmm. if the situation called for it. Mm -hmm. All right. Such men as Hymenaeus, Philetus, Damas, Alexander, and his second letter to Timothy. Mm -hmm. It was love that motivated this. Love for God and the people of God, even love for those sinners. That's right. The very things that the Holy Spirit and the early church found to be the essentials for the, the saints to abstain from, immorality, eating things, sacrifice to idols, these things were not only being done in Pergamum, but they were being taught. Now, let me just tell you something. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking of what I want to say. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, President Barack Barack Obama, Barack Hussein Obama. I don't know if you re can recall this, but when he was running for office the first time, the issue arose about the church that he had been attending for for years, decades. I oh, think 25 years yeah, he and his wife. Yeah, yeah. I believe they were married there. They mm -hmm. were part of this church for 20 and it was uh, Jeremiah Wright. And when it came out, what a racist that Jeremiah Wright was, and the fact that what he was preaching didn't line up with the Word of God, Barack Obama said, well, well, I didn't believe it. Right. He said, I sat there for 25 years, but I didn't, I didn't agree. Yeah. Well, the Word of God says, can two walk together unless they're in agreement? And the fact is, if you're sitting, listening to teaching that is wrong, teaching that is evil, teaching that is ungodly, teaching that doesn't line up with the Word of God, you are as Guilty. responsible by yeah. hearing it yeah. as the person is who's teaching it, unless you deal with it. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. 
And I think the church really needs to come to understand that fact, because within the church today, if the, if the church of Pergamum, 2,000 years, roughly 2,000 years ago, was tolerating sinners within their midst, even as they were teaching their ungodliness and the sin, mm -hmm. trust me. It's don't trust me. No. I repent of that. Test me. I said test. The church today, in so many places and in so many ways, is guilty of tolerating the teaching of sin within the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. Oh, don't judge. Don't judge. Mm -hmm. Pastors, you know what? You had better start protecting the sheep from the wolves. That's right. <sighs> okay. What teaching? Well, it says the teaching of Balaam. Now, Balaam from Pethor was a diviner. That's what it says in the Word. It says that in Joshua 13, 22, right? And the Word reveals that he loved the wages of unrighteousness. Mm. Okay? He was hired, underline that word, he was hired to curse the people of God. But he had no choice but to bless them because God would not hear his curse. Hmm. Oh, silly Christians who believe that the, 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 the curses of the enemy have power over us. Yes. Hmm. Just go. The you only word it. that has power in my life is the word of God. Amen. That's the only one. That's the only one. You know, when David went out on the battlefield with Goliath, mm -hmm. it says that one of the first things when the, during that encounter was Goliath cursed David by his gods. How'd that work out for him? Did it work out at all? It didn't work out at all. You need not fear people putting curses on you, but in turn you are to return blessing to them. Okay? That's right. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Okay? It says to bless those who curse you. If you have accepted Jesus as the Lord and Savior of your life, He is in control of your life. Amen. And His Word is what controls directs your life it. and directs it. Okay? Okay. So, however, His counsel, the counsel of Balaam to the people of God, caused the sons of Israel to play the harlot with the daughters of Midian mm. and to involve themselves in idolatry. Now, by the way, the, the, the Israelites wound up putting him to death. That's in Joshua chapter 13. They killed him at the end, you know. Mm. But, you see, he had turned and started following them. He said he was going back after he couldn't curse. He was going back to his home, which was, but he didn't. Mm. He started following them. They tolerated his presence. The guy was a hireling. He was, he was trying to sell the blessings and the curses of God. Mm -hmm. Okay? How many pulpits are full? With hirelings. With hirelings. Okay. Others throughout time would rush headlong into the era of Balaam. See, because Jude equates in his letter with licentiousness. Mm -hmm. Denying Jesus as Lord and Master, rejecting authority and indulging in gross immorality. Licentiousness means you think that you have, because of the grace of God, because of the forgiveness of God, the faithful forgiveness of God, you, you think that you now have a license to go out and do what's wrong. Yeah, do whatever you want. No. Mm -mm. We're supposed to have the mind of Christ, and as important, we should have the heart of God. God hates sin. We should be absolutely intolerant of sin. In our own lives. Because it separates us from God. Because that will drive you to repentance. Mm -hmm. If you begin to tolerate sin in your life, what you will do is begin to excuse the sin in your life. Mm -hmm. And you'll find justification for the sin in your life. Mm -hmm. And excuses are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. You see, at that time, there were in the church in Pergamum, as there are in the church today, mm -hmm. those who would sell their blessings. Mm -hmm. right? Many prominent ministers today proudly boast that the blessings, like healing, prosperity, a word from God, mm -hmm. are available through them if you only mail your offering today. Mm -hmm. You don't have to listen to much Christian, Christian television to see that kind of thing. No. And when you, The next time you see it, do me a favor, just get your little concordance out and go look up a, a, a Gehazi. 
and this, the account of Nahum, the, the leper, all right? And see what happened when, when Elijah, Elisha was sending him back without taking anything from him for having received the blessings of God. And no Gehazi, his servant, yeah. when chasing after him to get reward for, this, for the blessing of God. Go check that out and see what happened to him. The very thing, now I'm giving you a clue. The, the, the very thing that had befallen Nahum, leprosy, that God miraculously took out of his life, he then placed in the life of Gehazi because he was trying to sell the blessings. The second thing is it's usually those very same ministers who by word and deed, although very subtly usually, encourage the children of God to view the Lord as waiting upon their every command rather than vice versa. The role of a prophet of God is to call you back into a right relationship with God when you're not in it. And to remind you that he's Lord and you're not. Those ministries that do that, carrying forth the error of Balaam, seem to encourage their followers to set their minds on material things, to be like the world. As through Balaam's counsel, the Israelites mixed with the Midianites, so now do God's children mix or conform to the world, imitating those very ministers and their wives living in the finest houses, driving the most expensive cars, dressing in expensive clothing, weighted down with jewelry. We are to be imitators of God, beloved children, and we've seen him in Jesus. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't bless you with material things. But I'm telling you, you're not supposed to seek those material things. It's not about the material things. No. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. We are to pursue righteousness. That's what the Word of God says. When you start pursuing things, and any, any preacher, any minister, any other Christian who encourages you to seek the things, rather than to seek the God who is the God of all creation, they are teaching, following in the steps of Balaam. You see, Balaam was a mouth for hire. Mm. So Paul mm. says it will be in the last days. Mm. Right? He wrote to Timothy and he said, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate. This is the church he's talking That's to. Right. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires. 2 Timothy 4.3. How much plainer can that be? Well, the, yeah. The, how my, Alice is right. I mean, how, how plain does it have to be? The teachings that just go all through the New Testament, warning us of wolves in sheep's clothing, of those who will try and introduce destructive heresies, who, those who will come preaching a different gospel. The New Testament is filled with that. And yet... The teaching of the church today is not filled with that no, at all. Mm. Why? Are we tolerating the Balaams? Are we yes. tolerating that sin in the church? I just want to be just, just an offhand thing. Mm. Interestingly, the Hebrew name Balaam mm. is basically the equivalent of the Greek Nicolaitan, ah, which God like hates. Yes. All right? And we'll see here more. Right? You see... Peter describes them, and you have to see the similarities to the sinful ways that are mentioned in Jude, right? But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will also be false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be maligned, and in their greed they will exploit you with false words. But these, those teachers, will be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions, as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery, and it never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed, these are springs without water, promising freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. Those are verses, from, go read it, from, from Second Peter, the first and second chapter. I mean, these are the warnings that were given 2,000 years ago in the New Testament. After 
the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ after the day of Pentecost. Mm -hmm. This is written to that Bible-believing, spirit-filled church mm -hmm. back then. And he's talking about the times that will come. Yes. They have come. They're here. We're living in them. We are. So, yes, be discerning. Yes. Be discerning. Praying if you God. see sin, first of all, let me tell you something. If you see, if you see something, if you see sin, go to the mirror and check and make sure you're not seeing God holding up a mirror and reflecting something going on in your own life. Make sure about that. And then the instruction is there in the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus said, go to that. If you see a brother sin, go to him and him alone. And the process is there for dealing with it. But it has to be dealt with. Yes. It can't be ignored. It's not going to go away, as we've seen. You see, okay, now Balak is the guy that hired Balaam, right? Mm -hmm. He was the king of Moab, and he could not defeat, This is he knew he couldn't defeat the people of God, right? He couldn't do it with his might, so he attempted to defeat the, the Israelites by having a curse placed upon them. And when that couldn't work, didn't work, couldn't work, he brought destruction among them by enticing them to be like him. Remember, our warfare is not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities. See, this is what the devil will try and do, okay? John wrote, and this is, this is to his little children, that's us in. Yeah. He said, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Mm. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. 1 John 2, 15 and 16, right? Mm -hmm. We are spiritual beings dwelling yet within these bodies of flesh. Mm -hmm. And we are tempted daily by the adversary with his fleshly bait. Blade, bait. Bait. Say bait. Thank you. Bait. Worms, Worms. dangling from the hook. Yeah. <laughs> Probably not what he's dangling in front of you, but yeah. it's, it's the same principle, and there's a hook underneath but it. Right? Whatever it is he's dangling will turn into worms. <laughs> but you see, this is supposed to be our life, our new life in the Spirit. Because Paul wrote to the Galatians, and he said, Now those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Put aside the deeds of the flesh and walk according to the Spirit. We, we have the power to do that. And we do belong to Christ. Just as another little aside, if somebody asks you what church you belong to or what denomination you belong to, especially, I mean, I've had it some of them, oh, brother, what church do you belong to? And I will say, I belong to Jesus Christ. I've been purchased with a price. I am the church. Okay. Oh, okay, the Nicolaitans, yeah. Because we had that nephesis. Yeah, what, Al, I'm sorry. Yeah, Alice is absolutely right. This is what he said in his first letter, which was to the Ephesians. Mm -hmm. And he commended them because as he did, they also hated, hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Right. Whereas here in Pergamum, they're, they're holding to them. Right. The deeds, uh, the, the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Mm -hmm. Completely the opposite. Yes. Now, I, I don't say that condemning them, but I mean, remember God is saying that he had that against them. Right. They lived in a place that the Lord called, and if you, did, if you missed this last week, I really suggest you go back and look at it. That Pergamum was literally the city where Satan dwelled, yes. where his throne was. That's what he said. That's what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. They, this was kind of a special town in that way, right? The Nicolaitans, if you, if you missed the teaching on that in our study of the Ephesians, it's, it's here on the website. Yeah, go back. www.bibletalk.com. Okay. Because they are the professional clergy. They are the ones hired to be the clergy. Now, let me tell you something. It's a, if any man desires... The office of an overseer. If you desire to serve God, it is a good, good thing day. you desire. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you if you're looking for a good job, 
Go go check under plumbers and carpenters or something. Because it's good in that there is great reward at the end of it. Okay? But Jesus said they hated me, they're going to hate you. And the more prominent you are, and that's not, you know, not high and looked it up prominent, but the more that you are visible to the world, the more the attacks are going to come. I, I believe that with all my heart. And the more faithful you are to the Lord, the more heavily the, the attacks are going to come upon you. The fact is, and that's why I said, you know, Balaam, his name corresponds in Hebrew to Nicolaitans in the New Testament. And that is these people who are professionals, okay? Are we to be professionals? Yes. If, if by professional you mean that you profess the name of Jesus Christ, that you profess the great things that he has done for you, that you profess to the world the great things that he has done for those people out in the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We are to be professional in that we are constantly professing the word of God, powered by the love of God. And no matter what job we have, or we should be doing it as unto the Lord with all of our Whatever work. you do, do as unto the Lord. Don't Absolutely. Hold back anything. Yeah. Uh, so if you're a plumber, go plumb yeah, really for good. the Lord. Be a good plumber. And let your life light. And your life. Your, your, yeah. your light and your life and your word yeah. proclaim the glory, the love of God. All right? Yes. yes. Okay. So now I'm just going to move on, right? All right. Okay. And this. Now that I'm moving on, I'll probably have to end, yeah. Okay. Let me just read this and then uh, we're going to end on this point, right? Revelation chapter 2, verse 16. <laughs> Repent, therefore, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Repent, therefore. Mm -hmm. Repentance is the rightful fruit of godly discipline. And remember, it says in Hebrews 12, those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, mm -hmm. and he scourges every son whom he receives. And then going on further in that chapter, it says he disciplines us for our good, that we may share his holiness. Yes. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. This is what we were talking about earlier, right? That, that we're responsible not only to see that sin is not tolerated in our lives, but in the life of the church. Yes. False teaching and false prophecy are to be dealt with by the body. Mm -hmm. The saints in Pergamum were allowing the teaching that led to the error of Balaam to continue, and the Lord holds them accountable. We need, to re we need to recognize this, okay, mm -hmm. that we are responsible. Jesus Christ said, be careful what you listen to. If you're listening to false teaching, you're, you're responsible for the false teaching. That's right. You know, I, I was just up sharing at a church in the Outer Hebrides mm -hmm. in northern Scotland on the Isle of Lewis this weekend. And as I was, and again, these people basically, not, they don't know me. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, you know, don't trust me. <laughs> But test me. Test me. Don't trust me. Test me. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I, what I'm speaking is the Word of God, if it's according to the Word of God, if it's if I have dawn, light in that, right? Mm -hmm. Then you're responsible for it. If it's not the Word of God, don't be don't be polite right. to me. It's Kick right. me out. Get rid of me. Don't. And the church needs to be doing that. Yes. You know, many false prophets. Test the spirits. Many false prophets have gone abroad. So we are to be to be testing these things and dealing with these things. We need to do that here, okay? Um, I am not, and I know you've noticed this, I'm not infallible. Thanks for not bringing it up. <laughs> bringing it up. Okay. But test what's said. Test it against the Word of God. And then have a little conversation with God about everything that you hear, all right? Be discerning because you are responsible. If you listen to junk, you are responsible for having chosen to listen to it. Okay, you've dialed it in, mm -hmm. all right? If you're listening to the Word of God, you're responsible for it. You're responsible to do it. Because you're not supposed to be just a hearer of the Word, but to be a doer of the Word. 
But either way, you bear responsibility. Okay, we live in irresponsible times where people say, well, not me, not me. You know that something? Yes, me, me, me. We will stand and answer for the things that God has entrusted us with. And he has entrusted you, I promise you. He has entrusted you. I know that if you're here right now, he has entrusted you with his word. He has entrusted you with his love. He has entrusted you and filled you with his spirit. You are responsible for those things. And that should not be a burden, but that should be a blessing. It's an incredible blessing in your life. Hallelujah. So, Father, we thank you for all of your blessings in our life, Lord God. And, Lord, it's only by your grace, it's only by your mercy, your compassion, it's only by your spirit that you have put within us, that you have chosen to make us the temple of your spirit, Lord God, that we have the power to be faithful, that we would not deny your name, that we would be faithful even unto death, that we would be willingly proclaiming your glory and your love to all about us, encouraging one another every day, as long as it's still called today, that we would be going out into the world bringing the light of your love, the light of your word, that we would recognize what Jesus said on the Sermon on the Mount, the reality of that in our own lives, that we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Help us to be those faithful witnesses, Lord God, that you use for your purpose and for your glory. So we just praise you and thank you for that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, that bounced around a little bit. Yeah, we did. We've been bouncing around a little bit. That's, uh, yeah. I'm glad you could be with us. And again, you know, if you have any questions or comments or suggestions, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Barring that or bearing with that, I know that Alice wants to tell you right now. Remember, Jesus loves you. And tell somebody else. A lot. God bless you and goodbye until next time.